All right, we're back. We are game 2015 in the winter 2018 semester. We're week four, part two of our broadcast. We're talking about Blender hard surface modeling, uh, at least an intro to that. Uh, lots of techniques here, and it'll be a multi-class kind of um, tutorial series. I'll be showing you some stuff that you can use. There won't be a final model this time around like before. Before we make a final model and you can include it in your game, won't be like that this time around. I got to show you some basics about Blender and then maybe another time you can use some of those basics to create your own or modify your models. Um, I also want to point you to the, the tool set that I'm using. I, and I'm using this uh, 3D tower. I put it up on um, Slack. So please download the 3D tower. So there's a challenge for you today, okay? So people who are really great with Blender, here's your challenge, right? Uh, and I want you to use Blender. Some people have been using things like 3D Studio Max and Maya. Uh, that's great that you know that tool where I'm teaching another tool. So please use that one instead. It's another tool in your toolbox. What I want you to do is in Blender, and I'm just going to kick off this uh, uh, little tower. Um, and I've done this challenge with other teams before, not just uh, here at uh, George Brown. I want you to, with the best of your ability and your knowledge, draw or create this tower. Okay, very simple tower. You know, it looks like it's very, um, you know, kind of symmetrical and all that kind of stuff, which is good. There's only one challenge. It's kind of not front facing. It's kind of to the side, which gives, me, gives you a little bit of a thing, an issue. Um, and we're going to be talking about how to bring this in, this image in as a plane. That's the first thing. We're going to use images as planes, bring this in. We're going to change the size of our cube. That's the, what we're going to try and do here. I'm going to show you some things. But if you're faster than me and if you want to try things on your own, and you have another idea of how you want to do this, go ahead. It's good practice for you. This is the idea. Every time we get together, I want you guys to practice with Blender, practice with Blender, keep doing practicing, practicing. And so you get more comfortable with the whole uh, framework in order for you to be able to produce some kind of simple models. I don't expect uh, crazy ones. Um, as well as have an understanding of how hard surface modeling and even things like uh, character modeling can be done. Just a very high level. I don't expect you guys to come out as Blender artists, like I said. Hard surface modeling is really describes things like I want to make a I want to make a building I want to make a something that's hard, you know, a rough texture or I want to make a machine I want to make a mech I want to make a, you know, um, a car you know those kind of things some kind of vehicle or I want to make a gun I want to make a flashlight I want to make a, you know whatever any of those things that's hard surface modeling right when we talk about character modeling, that's more like soft surface modeling, where you use more natural, organic modeling, right? Um, it's a totally different way of doing things, and there's different techniques. So right now, we're only talking about hard surface modeling, and there's some very simple techniques you can use to create stuff fairly quickly, right? One thing we're going to be using is we're going to take this tower, and when we create our, our, our uh, cube, we're going to use a cube, a, a primitive. And then I'm going to cut the whole tower in half and use something called a mirror modifier. Because a lot of times when we do hard surface modeling, we have symmetry. I have two sides of the tower. They're identical, right? And for me to do both sides by hand, it might look more original, but it's going to take twice as long. We also use symmetry and mirror, mirror modifiers for things like organic models, like humans. If I want to draw a person's face, I took, let's say I wanted to model Michael's face. So I took Picture model of, of my model, Michael, right? Click, click, right in the front, the side, the top, the back, right? And the other side. And then I put some, I use reference images to get, you know, an image of your face, right? Well, if I start doing both sides, your eyes will be slightly different. Maybe your mouth will be different on one side compared to the other side. And what I want to try and do, even with, uh, with organic models, is try and be as symmetrical as possible in the beginning, right? It's easier and it cuts down the work. Again, there's many ways of doing this, this stuff, and there's different techniques we can use. I'm just talking about some of the simpler ones. All right, so that's the image we're going to be using. I'm going to shut this down for now. What I want to do now is we want to bring up Blender. So please bring up Blender if it's not already on. Again, as of this, as of this recording, I'm using Blender 2.79. We're on the threshold of 2.8. It's not quite out yet. I'm going to get rid of my cube. I'm going to do that by pressing the X key. And what I want to do is I want to import the images planes, but that import operation may not be available to you until you modify your add-ons. So here's what we're first going to do. We're going to go to file. We're going to go to user preferences. 
And under add-ons, I'm going to search for images. So please do a search for images here, which is going to come up with this add-on called images as planes. You need to have this add-on checked. Okay. It may not be checked on. Again, uh, Ian, all I did was go to file user preferences. I went to add-ons and then I went, I searched for images on the left here, which basically filtered the add-ons. I want to check on images as planes and then click on save user settings. Please save user settings. And I've already done that, so I'm not going to do it, but it, what it'll do is it'll allow me to import my image as planes. Now, my expectation is you've got that image, that tower image from Slack. That's where I put it, downloaded it, put it on your desktop or somewhere on your machine. Okay. Now I'm going to file import images as planes. That's the next uh, command I'm going to use, right? Now there's two ways we can do this. Two ways we can use a reference image. We're always going to use reference images. Uh, even artists use <coughs> reference images um, for two reasons. One is because it's just easier. It saves time, right? So a lot of times an artist might draw something out. They want to model that they want to draw. They, they picture, you know, they have a little drawing or, or a painting or whatever. And they draw it out. And then what we can do is we can use that image to create a three-dimensional object. Okay. So I've got this little image. You can see that it came in. Images as planes. It wouldn't work unless you added on that and click that add-on. But we have a bit of a problem. One of our problems is it's way too small. Right? So our, our image is way too small. And it's somewhere in the, um, I'm just going to connect my little external keyboard here. Uh, again, I'm using a MacBook Pro, and I don't have an Numeric keypad, so I've just got my external keypad. Again, uh, not that very expensive from Amazon, 20 bucks. You can get one even less now. I'm going to press the one key to go into front mode, right, a front view. And I'm going to click the five key to go into front ortho mode. Okay, we're going to make some changes here to the project. Notice when I do this, and if I zoom in, that our image is turned aside. We don't want that. I want to rotate my image, so I'm going to press the R key, and I'm going to press the Z key right afterwards, and I'm going to press negative 90 on my uh, keyboard. So negative, or the minus sign, the 90, which will rotate the object so that it faces uh, our front view. I can't see the image. And the reason why I can't see the image is because of our shading options. In the middle button here, in the middle right here, you can see that there is our shading method or our viewport shading. You can see that right now we're in solid mode. I want to move from solid mode to material mode. And when we do this, it'll turn black. So again, I move from solid mode to material mode. The reason why it's black is there's no lighting from this side. I want to open up this uh, panel on the right-hand side here. I'm going to kind of expand this on the right. I'm going to go to the fourth tab on the right, which is the material tab. We've talked about this last week when we did materials and texturing at a very high level. And I want to scroll this sidebar down until I come to shading. And I want to click on shadeless, which will turn on this model. You, can, you don't need light to see this anymore. Okay, shadeless. And that's a, on a per model basis. You can make it so that there is no light required. If you did this on a regular model, it would be like bright. It would almost be emissive. It would look like it's casting its own light in some ways. In fact, you can make a model emissive. You can make a model so that it's glowing if you want. This is, again, is the shader program that's, been, that's, uh, that's on Blender that we're using here. All right, so this is cool. I want to bring up the numeric transform for a second. Let me make this a little bit smaller. And on the third tab on uh, inside of our, on the right-hand panel here, I want to choose the, the, the uh, unit presets to meters. I want to change the unit presets to meters. And if you notice, our model has a one meter. It's pretty small. It's one meter. So if I was going to really model this out, my model is like pretty small. It's like one meter high. That doesn't make any sense for a tower to be one meter. I want it to be in game. I want it to be 15 meters. I want it to be a tower, right? So I need to scale this model up, okay? Uh, in previous iterations, what I did was um, I went to, I moved this model up. Let's try this together. So I'll move this model up to this so that it's in line with the bottom of the screen here. 
I can move it by eye, right? Or I can just put in, you know, 0.5 meters and it'll be exactly at the bottom because remember, um, right now each unit is a meter and, and by default Blender puts it in the middle, which is, you know, kind of half up and half below the surface, right? And typically notice that the, our focus, our focal point or registration mark is the middle of the model. Well, you, do, you can change that. We're in the middle where it says right down here, you can see that the pivot is the center for rotation and scaling. Instead of making the pivot the center, let's make our, the bottom the center where the, where the, where the uh, cursor is right now. So I can change that by clicking this button and move it to the 3D cursor. So now the cursor is the is the pivot for the for the model itself or the scaling. That means scaling is going to start down here and move up this way and across. Okay. Are we good? Are you with me? I'm going slow. I think I'm going slow. How about that one? Right. All right. I want to scale. I want to scale. And um, I'm going to get rid of the side panel here just for more real estate so you can see it. I'm going to also pull this down a little bit by pressing the middle mouse button and shift at the same time so I can drag my object around, right? And I want to press the S key and notice it's going to start from the bottom and work its way up, right? And I want you to make this uh, tower expand. I can keep dragging if you notice my mouse so that it is 15 meters from a dimensions perspective, 15 meters. And then click the left mouse button just to uh, accept your changes. So notice I'm on the right here where it says dimensions, it's 15 meters. I'm gonna scroll out so I can see it now. So now it's in line with what it would be in, in on uh, Unity. If I brought this into Unity, it would be 15 meters high. And remember last week we did a kind of a tower and we made it a few sections, four, four, and four. That was 12 meters high, it was pretty tall, right? So this is even taller than that, right? So quite a big, quite a big tower. I'm going to shift just for our purposes. I'm going to shift the focus because I'm not going to change this anymore. I'm going to shift the focus here from our cursor back to median point. All right. Just so that I don't forget, because if you forget that you'll have some weird effects. You're like, hold on, wait, why, why is it expanding like this? And why is it expanding from, you know, how I expect it to uh, scale or rotate or whatever. So I just want to switch it back. That's just a little switch down here. We can do it's kind of a neat trick. All right, so I've got this thing. And remember, we talked about this being my reference image. So all it is is a plane, right, that I can use as a backdrop, uh, you know, when I when I create a, an object. We're going to take this away eventually. We're going to start with this one, and then we're going to actually put this in the background as a background image. So there's two ways you can use reference images. Images as planes and as a background image. Both have their uses, okay? Images as planes, always going to show up. As long as the model's in, in play, you'll always see it right? Background images are only going to be available and visible by from one perspective. And that means if you put it into perspective mode and you look at it from an angle, you won't see the background image at all. But once you go into front view, side view, top view, or whatever, you'll be able to see it, right? So there's different reasons why we do both things. All right, so I want to add, again, I'm going to make sure my center is at the, or my cursor is at the center. If it's out here somewhere and I want to put it back to center, there's two ways to do that. I could physically change the cursor settings by going down to the bottom where it says cursor and changing the values to zero. So I can just like kind of zero this out eventually, right? That's one way. Or I can press shift S cursor to center, which is the fastest way. That kind of puts the cursor to center. Now I want to shift A and I want to add another mesh. I want to add a cube. The cube should be black like this. I'm going to move the cube up exactly where the other one is so I'm, but i'm going to do this a little bit more by eye so i'm going to move this up so that the bottom of the cube kind of starts at the bottom of the of the tower okay and notice that my tower is kind of offset so instead of modifying the cube for now i'm going to right click on the tower and move it zoom in a little bit i'm going to move it so that it is centered as much as i can make it a by I. There it is. So to me, that looks like a centered tower on the bottom. There's my cube. It looks black. It's black because there's no lighting on the cube right now. Okay. All I've done is made a cube, move it up to where the tower is at the bottom. I've aligned it with the bottom of the tower. I'm going to use my cube as a primitive to make a tower out of it. That's all I'm doing. 
the same dimensions as the tower, as, as much as possible anyway. Okay, so there's my cube at the bottom. And just like I did before, I want to change the scaling point of my cube to the cursor. But guess what? The cursor is down here. That would not be good. It's almost like I want to make it so that my cursor is at the bottom of the cube. We can do it that way, or I'm going to show you another technique. We can go into edit mode and just modify the vertices and pull the vertices up for the cube. All right. So let's go into edit mode for a second. And you can see that in edit mode, everything is selected in my cube. I'm going to deselect all. I'm going to go into, that's with the A key. I'm going to click the Z key and go into wireframes for a second. In edit mode, I'm going to, there's two selection modes I showed you last week. What were they? Do you remember? Box and circle. So the B and the C key. B for box select mode and C for circle select mode. All right. So I'm going to click on the B key. And when I'm in when I'm in wireframe mode, if I select the vertices on the top, both the front vertices and the back vertices get automatically selected, right? Cool. Now that I've got those vertices selected, right, I want to bring this object up as high as I can. So I'm going to switch back from um, from wireframe mode. I'm going to switch back. I'm going to press the Z key again. Change back my shading to material so I can see what I'm doing here. And I'm going to zoom out. I'm still in edit mode. I'm going to zoom out, and I'm just going to pull this. This is another way of doing it. I'm going to pull this object all the way to the bottom of this lip over here of the tower. So all I've done is expanded my cube. I've just pulled it up, right, so I can, I can actually literally um, expand or scale, you know, by, you know, uh, transforming my, my object the way I like, by picking the, uh, the vertices or the edges or the faces. Now, if you didn't do what I did, if you didn't go into wireframe and try the same thing, you may only have just the front vertices and you'll have a weird object. Something else will happen, not just what this is happening. What you should have right now is something that looks like this, where it, where, where it uh, bisects, the image bisects the cube almost exactly. If you don't have this, it's because you did something wrong. Okay, so now we have to expand the, the width of this thing, right? I want to make it the width bigger, and I'm going to go back into object mode for that. So I'm going to press the tab key to go back into object mode. And I'm going to press scale, S to scale, but only across the X axis. And again, I'm going to do that. So if I pull it out, you can see that it's going to take the size of my, approximately size of my tower. My values that I'm getting are 3.16 and 8.92 right now. Let's make this so that they're even. So I'm going to make this. Uh, 3.15 on the x-axis. We'll make this 9 meters, right, on the z-axis. 9 meters on the z-axis. And you know what? We can't let the y-axis go bad because now it's really narrow on the y side, right? We want the y-axis to be proportional to the x-axis. Let's make the y 3.15 as well. So 3.15 meters. If you want to do what I'm doing. I'm getting you the exact numbers that I'm using. Okay. So now if we look at it now, it's more proportional. It's more of a cube shape. And that's really what our tower looks like. Our tower is kind of proportional, right? All right, cool. So we've got our cube and we've got our cube at the uh, you know that makes it look kind of like a tower in approximately the central position, right? Uh, where our tower is. So right now I don't need my tower anymore. I'm using my tower for all it's worth. All I wanted was for just the size of my object. I blocked up the size. Now I want to make my reference object a background image, right? So that way, if I go into wireframe mode, I can see it. Right now, when I go into wireframe mode, everything is wireframes, and including my reference image, which doesn't, even, doesn't help me at all, right? So I want to sw switch back to shade the shading mode to material when I did that. And I want to just hide my image. Now, the way you can hide your image or any object on the screen is the H key. So press the H key. It becomes hidden. I also want to hide my lamp and my camera. I don't need those right now. So I can just press the H key to hide those things. If I want to bring them back on a PC, it's Alt-H. That'll put everything back. And on a Mac, it's Option-H, like if you're using the Mac. All right, so scrolling down all the way, I'm going to scroll all the way down where I have on the on the numeric uh, table here on the numeric uh, panel, on the uh, there is a background image option, 
I'm going to add image on the background image option. I'm going to click open and I'm going to select the same image that I have on the desktop that I used earlier. So I'm going to go to my desktop and I'm going to go to 3D Tower and I'm going to click open image. Notice how it brought it in. It brought it in way down here again. Right? There it is. Okay? So this is a background image. And the only reason you're going to be able to see this is if you're in some perspective. For example, if I take this out of out of uh, view, this view, and I move it into perspective mode, I see nothing. I don't see a background image at all. But as soon as I put it into front view or side view or top view, which is really weird, doesn't make any sense, right? I should have a top view of my tower here, um, or whatever, any kind of view, I will be able to see my image, right? I'm in my front view right now, and but my image is way lower because it gets brought into Blender in the middle of the screen. So to modify that, if I scroll down. There are some background image controls that you can use. Notice that there is a size image control. I want to change this size to 15 meters because we know our image is 15 meter meters. That's the first thing I want you to do. So the size right here of the image, the background image, 15 meters. And then I want to use the Y slider. And this is a slider. If you actually click in here and slide, you can actually move this object up. I'm going to move this up so at the bottom of the image hits this bottom as much as I can. My value is going to be something like 7.4, it looks like, 7.4. And if I look at the image, you can see that, again, it's not centered because I moved the image around. So I'm going to use the X uh, slider here to move my image so that it approximately is centered. I may have to do this again, by the way. My value is about 0.2. I think I may have to move it even to the left more, something like 0.25. Something like that. You're going to see. Let's leave it at 0.25 for now. So you can see now that I have my background image and I can see my black cube. But now if I press the Z key, I see the image that I want with my wireframes, right? Wireframes are great because it allows me to manipulate my image. And I can see I can kind of start uh, doing image manipulation on my, my, uh, my object without the image disappearing. Also notice there's also opacity. If I want to make the image more opaque or more transparent, I can bring that image into being. By default, it's 0.5. So I can make it a little bit more transparent so it doesn't bother me so much. Or I can make it as opaque as I wanted to make it. Let's just put that back to 0.5, just so that way we don't mess around with your view. All right, cool. So we've got the image. Let's get rid of this numeric transform for a second so I have more real estate. So here's what I want to do now, right? Remember I talked about I'm going to do some hard surface modeling on this image, but you know what? It's symmetrical. Notice that the door here and this part up here, there's two sides to it. It looks almost identical. So imagine if I do those separately. That's double the work. I want to cut my object in half. In order for me to do this, I'm going to go into edit mode for my object. So I'm going to select my object. I'm going to go into edit mode by pressing tab. Right? I'm going to deselect all and then select all. And I want to subdivide my object one time. All right, So I'm going to click on my, my uh, toolbar on the left. You can also use the W key for this. I'm going to go back down to subdivide. And I'm only subdividing one time like this. I'm going to get rid of this toolbar for, for now so you can see what I'm doing. So this is what I have so far. Are you with me? What this looks like in edit mode is like this. Take a look. Right? It looks like this. I've got a tower with a right or a, an, a, a cube. Right? That's been expanded like this. A quadrahedron, if you will. Right? That's been expanded. And it, it's got the same shape kind of as the tower. And now when I bring it back in, you can see that I've just subdivided in the middle. I want to deselect all. And what I want to do is I want to select the left side only. So I'm going to use my B select mode, so the B button. I'm only going to select this part, not the middle, just the left side. Okay? And now you can see that the left side has been selected. And then I want you to press X to delete it. And I want you to delete the vertices. When you do that, and if I select, if I press A to select all again, you can see that I've chopped away half of my object. Okay? Like I talked about. So half of my object is gone. 
theoretically, because the, the tower is so symmetrical, I can probably do another chop and chop off the back part of my object and only have a quarter of my object there, right? For now, though, we don't want to go too crazy with you guys. Just half of your object is enough. Bringing it back to the front view with the one on the numeric keypad, I'm going to scroll over on the right-hand side. There's a little wrench, if you notice, kind of in the middle. Right, so it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven from the left. And, you know, if you can see this, and one, two, three, four, five, six from the right. So kind of in the middle, right? This little wrench, I'm going to click onto it. And this little wrench allows us to add modifiers. Now, modifiers, this is a ton of modifiers. Blender is a beautiful program in terms of how much functionality, not so beautiful in terms of how it hides the functionality. Uh, so a lot of stuff is hidden. I want to choose the mirror modifier. By default, what it's going to do is going to mirror this side to the other side. Notice that the axis is the x-axis is mirroring across. Also, please turn on clipping. That way, if you modify anything in the middle, it won't unclip the middle from the other side. And I'll explain that another day. Okay, we don't want to apply the mirror right now. All I want to do is create the mirror, all right? And if I zoom in, and it's hard for you to see it, there's, you can see now that there's a line, a faint line that's up here that basically shows you the mirror. If I go into solid mode, you can see that I actually have a full shape now, but I only have control over half of it. Okay? Again, technique. I'm going to go back into uh, wireframe mode by pressing the Z key. Use the front key, or the one, to, to go into front mode. And now this is, my, this is the subject of what I want to do. If I scroll in, I have this door, and I want. here's the challenge for you guys, all right? First challenge. Let's make the door. Notice it's a rounded object. It's not a squarish object. If it's square, like the windows, no problem. We cut it out, and we're good to go. But here we have a problem. Here we have a, a rounded object. We may have some kind of other object like this in the future. And if I zoom in a little bit more, you can see that I'm not quite centered, like I said, right? So I may modify, I may have to modify my background image even more to push it this way towards the right so that it's completely centered as much as possible. The more centered I get it, the more realistic the door will look. Let's put in the numeric transform again. I'm going to scroll all the way down to where that background image is, right? And you can see that here's the X or lateral controls, right? So horizontal controls. I want to move it so that it's somewhat in the middle. You can see it's 4.5. It's pretty big. If I type in 0.4, you can see that that's kind of better. And maybe 0 0.36, 0 0.35, you got 0.35, let's see what 0.35 looks like. That looks pretty good. Let's try 0.36, if I can make it even better. Because I'll tell you, if, I, if you want to scroll in to see that, you can see that it's not quite, the, the keystone on the top of the door is not quite centered. It's not it's almost hard, just hard to see here. But I want to try and make it as centered as possible to get the best effect. So maybe 0.36, maybe even more, more maybe 0.365. So 0 0.365, like really, yeah, there it is. That's, that, that's probably the best I can get, 0.365 on mine. Yours may be slightly different, remember? I have a different resolution than you. I have a different computer than you. Uh, you may have brought the image in differently, you know, and on and on. I'm not going to go too crazy. Just center it as much, best you can. All right, cool. Now that we got this, I don't need my numeric transform anymore. I'm going to take it away. I'm going to zoom out again so you can see what the image is. I've kind of zeroed in on the door here, right? And what I want to do is I want to start cutting away the door as much as possible. A couple techniques here. And this is a new command that I want you to learn, right? I want you to try Control-R, Control-R. And what this does is it creates something called this loop cut and slide effect, right? It creates an edge, an edge loop, right? Here's the edge loop. If I go toward the right, it gives me a purple line that goes horizontal. If I go toward the bottom, it gives me a purple line going vertical. Let's use the purple line going vertical for now. And I'm going to cl left click to get that going. Notice now that I can actually loop or, uh, or cut wherever I want. So I'm going to cut as close to the door as possible. Don't scroll out at this point because what it might do is inject additional cuts. We don't want that. And to show you what I'm talking about, if I press the T key to bring it back in, I have the ability to increase the number of cuts I can do at once, right? We don't want that. We want only one cut here, right, when I, when I control R. 
And I've done what I've done is I've tried to bring it in. I'm just gonna take the toolbar away again. I'm gonna, if you notice, I want to try and get as close to the side of this, what looks like this rock, the stone that goes around the door as possible. And again, I'm using an image that I got from the internet. It's just for demonstration purposes. I want to do another cut here, right? Just right down here on the bottom. So I'm gonna use on this side with my mouse in this, this part, control R again and go towards the bottom. And then I'm gonna left click and slide it so that it's as close to the to the stone as I can, I can get. Right. So now I have another cut that goes right here. Right. Again, guys, there's many ways to do this. This is I just want to show you a couple of things this time. Control R for loop cut and slide, which is a really cool effect, right? And you can do a lot with it. Control R is one of my favorite uh, tools to use because you can create areas that you cut away, that you uh, you scale in that particular area. You're adding more geometry that you have control of. Here on the right, on the top, I want to add another cut this way. So I'm going to Control R. And I'm, on, I'm, I'm going to hang out towards the right side now. I'm going to left click and move my cut so that it's at the top of the door as much as possible. Cool. So I got my cut here. I want another cut at the bottom of the door. So again, Control R, left click. I'm going to bring this up to the bottom of the door. We've done these cuts. These are pretty good, right? I think it gives us some additional geometry here. I can even add more, but I don't want to go crazy. And the reason why, because for a video game, you want to have something called a low poly model, not too many polygons, right? The lower poly the model is, the more it's usable in your game. It doesn't take a lot of computation to render this, uh, this object in game, right? So the more cuts I make, the more polygons I make for each of the models. I made more, I have more uh, quads, more triangles eventually as well. Okay, and I don't want that. All right, so, and sometimes we have something called a, a polygon budget, right? I might tell you, okay, I want you to make your tower, but you can't have more than 3,000 polygons. Right now, if you look on the top right, you can see that I have, my verts is nine, right? And 51, right? And if you look in the right, there's also faces and edges. You don't want too many more, uh, if, you, if you actually have a bigger screen, I can't, you can't see it on my screen because mine is projecting, but it actually tells you the poly count. All right, well, I, this is good, but my problem is, how about the geometry here? How can I make this thing rounded, right? Well, I'm gonna use my K tool to cut. I wanna cut some of this stuff uh, on the side. Again, I'm in wireframe mode to do this. I'm gonna zoom in as much as I can. Again, I'm in, I'm in centimeters right now. And I wanna start cutting, and I'm gonna use this edge up here as an anchor, right? I'm gonna click, I'm gonna, I'm gonna select the K uh, button. And I'm gonna start dragging my edge as much as possible and left clicking to get the shape of my door and I'm gonna anchor it on the other edge and press enter. What this does is it creates a cut, a number of vertices I'm adding. So I'm adding more geometry, okay? Now we have a problem because I have a lot of floating vertices and floating vertices when it comes to C++ and uh, computer graphics are no good. We need to fix this problem and we will in a few minutes. But we're going to make the shape first. We're blocking it out like we did before, right? So we're blocking out the shape. I'm going to keep cutting. I'm going to use this area here. I'm going to keep cutting it so as much as possible from this vert all the way down until this kind of has a rounded shape to it. So again, I'm going to use the K key to make the knife tool. And what it's going to do is going to continue cutting as close to the stone as I can get, right, without being too geometrical and more... I'm going to put this over here. I'm going to anchor it over here so it's going to be offline for a second, right? Press enter, and I'm going to fix it. And then I'm going to do the inside, okay? So I'm going to come from here, right? You can see that this is need, this needs adjusting as well. I'll, I'll adjust that in a second. I'm going to use the K key to kind of select from this angle and kind of come in. I Notice I, I chose that vert right there. And all I'm trying to do is create this rounded shape as much as possible, right? By adding additional geometry and, and also anchoring it to existing uh, edges. So how does it look now? It looks like this. I have some basic geometry. But the problem is I have a lot of extra information, extra edges that I don't need. 
I want to get rid of some of these. If I deselect all, and I'm going to go back into um, solid mode by pressing the Z key so you can see it all, right? So you can see that I've kind of created the shape of my object a little bit, right? And what I want to do here is I want to kind of zoom in, and I want to talk about how this is going to be rendered. I can't have these floating vertices like these ones here have, who are not that they're not connected to anything. C++, when you bring in C++ or even Unity, will not know what to do with these things. It will not know how to, how to, how to, how to create this. Unity, C++, Unreal, all these other, all these other uh, you know, platforms, whether you're using you know, C++, which is the native uh, OpenGL platform, let's say, um, or a game engine like Unity or Unreal, it needs, best case, triangles and quads, right? If you don't have triangles and quads, you may have some really weird looking models that don't quite look exactly like you want them to do when you bring them into uh, those programs, right? So what to do? First of all, what the heck is this shape? This is not a quad. This is like some kind of weird shape. We need to cut it up to make it quads, right? And we have this extra edge here we don't need. There's no need for this edge, right? If we have all this geometry here, we can make other edges in here. But first, before we do this, what I want to do is make a cut that goes from here to here to start supporting this, these, these uh, edges. So again, I'm going to go from the middle edge out to here and make another cut with the K tool, the knife tool, deselect all, make another cut across this edge from here. You can see that I'm making quads. That's all I'm doing, right? So there's a, there's a triangle here. Here's a quad. Okay, cool. I can probably get rid of this edge now, but let's just keep going, right? Again, I'm going to make a knife tool. Here's another quad. And we get a bit of a problem, but I'll add another cut anywhere here like this. So it looks like another quad, which gives us a little bit more information we can use. And you can see that slowly, slowly, as I cut across here, I can add information to make my life a little easier. Okay, let's get rid of that edge or that the, the series of edges now. The way I would do that is I'm going to shift into edge select mode. So control tab, go into edges, select my edges, and then press X. Now I don't want to delete them. I want to do something new. It's called dissolve. I want to dissolve my edges. And what dissolve does is it removes them, but it doesn't make a cut in the model, right? It just, I don't need those edges anymore. So they're not being drawn anymore, right? Yeah. Because if I don't manually make the quads, then what ends up happening is the program, Unity, Unreal, your C++ program, will not know what to do. Quads and triangles are the way, what we want to do. Once we, once we go a step away from quads and triangles, you'll have weird artifacts all over the place. You'll have Z fighting. You'll have a bunch of stuff that happens, which we don't want. Yeah, yeah. Don't. Remember, I'm, I'm telling you how to do things basics. You, want to, you can try and do that, but the problem with that is it may not work exactly how you think it works. This way, you're guaranteed you're, you're controlling the cuts, right, which is much better. Hmm? So, um, so that's the next part. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep going through this and controlling the cuts. Now, there's some areas here that have a really small triangle. Maybe we can get rid of that triangle eventually. But for now, I'm going to go back into vertex select mode. And you can see that I got some other verts that I want to connect. So I want to connect this vert, K, connect this vert. And notice I'm cutting across this edge, which I'm going to get rid of in a sec, right? And again, I'm going to do the same thing with this vert here. And I got this other vert right here, and maybe we can do something to get rid of it, all right? Because we got some extra information here. Now I'm going to get rid of this edge, this whole edge right here. I'm going to get rid of it. So again, I'm going to go to Control-Tab. Going to edge select mode, select this edge, which is a series of edges now. And let's see how it works. Sometimes it won't work. We have to wait. Dissolve edges. And so far, it looks like we're pretty good. All I'm doing is getting rid of extra geometry that I don't need. Makes our keeps our model low poly and allows me to do uh, modifications to our object. All right, this is kind of weird, right? We got this thing, the situation where I want to bring this edge here. So let me go into vertex select mode. I want to bring this one to meet with this one. Why? Because that way I don't have additional geometry. I don't need, this doesn't make any sense, this shape right now, right? 
I want to kind of make the shape more understandable for the computer, right? So I want to take this vert. I'm going to bring the toolbar back up, the T key. And if you notice on the left, I have this merge option here, right? I'm going to take this edge and I'm going to go with this edge. So first and last. And if I can, I don't know if it always works because depending on how it's, a, it's aligned, I'm going to try and merge at last. So now what's happened is I've taken two verts and merged them together into one. I've removed a whole vertice away, and I've got the shape that I want. I still have a quad here. Look, one, two, three, four. That's a quad. I'm good, right? As long as I have a quad or a triangle, triangles less are less um, less desirable, right? Then I have a, a shape to make sense of what I'm doing. Same thing here. I can probably use this triangle, this this thing here to make a, a triangle. I don't want to come into here. Once I do this, I open myself up to more problems on this side. So I want to kind of keep everything inside my little world here. Here's another problem. I have this vert and this vert. Maybe what I can do is bring them together, but I want to look at um, my object. Remember I talked about this as a defect. I could probably bring this a little closer. Let's do that. So I'm going to kind of do one of these. And then just pull it to the right a little bit. So my whole line is going to be pulled in, right? Now I can probably bring this down, right? If I take this vert and if I use the G key, I can probably pull it down so I can make it as close to this one as possible, right? If I zoom in, really zoom in, now I'm going into millimeters in a second, you can see that they're still quite far away from a millimeters perspective. Take a look. Like they're really far away here, right? Now, what I want to do ultimately is put this one or this one down here. So I want to take this one here and move it down here. But I'm going to show you that sometimes there's an effect that you don't want. If I've merged it last, sometimes you get this. See this? That shadow means that it's folded over, right? I don't want folding like that. It means like some part of the geometry is going to be behind the other parts. That's not good, right? So let's undo that change. So sometimes it's not possible, but sometimes what you can do instead is bring that as close to here as possible, right? And we'll do what we'll do later on is remo remove doubles, which might be better than what we're doing here. So just right on top of each other. If I zoom out again, you can see that there's very little difference uh, from what I'm doing, right? You can see also that if I have defects, like if this is not quite round enough, like for example, over here, I can pull this manually by using the G key and pulling it in. So this though, it's a little bit nicer, a better fit, if you will, with the geometry that I want. Like this one here probably can be pulled all the way down a little more. This one over here, you can see that I can probably pull this down a little bit more, right? And slowly, slowly what you can get is more of a rounded shape, right? It'd be nice if we get this keystone here, this, this stone right here aligned, it's not quite aligned. Like I can also all I imagine if I'm if I'm um, I'm texturing this one, I want to make it so that the texture is almost exactly the lines where I'm where I'm cutting are the exact places where the stone would be, right? For from a texturing perspective, that's pretty cool too, right? So kind of bring those stones in because they're not really round anyway. They're stones, right? And I'm trying to get it so that the stones wherever they're cut is where I'm putting my cut, right? So this one over here somewhere. Notice I can't quite do that because I got that extra piece of geometry there, right? And that's okay. Yeah. Again, I can try and pull it down as much as possible. Sometimes it kind of kind of goes out of bounds. Again, there's those there's there's two points. I'm gonna actually undo that change and I'll I'll get rid of it later. It doesn't have to be perfect, guys. I mean, like it's very close. And it's not going to follow the, the reference anyway, 100%, right? There's all these other cuts I can put into, but I'm not going to. So I've got kind of the cuts I want, but I got a problem. I got a bunch of problems, actually. Remember, I talked about quads, but well, this isn't a quad. This is something else, right? So I'm going to use the K key. And again, this is one solution to kind of put this up to here to make triangles. Again, triangles are less desirable, but better than some weird shape that the computer doesn't know, like something that has multiple vertices, right? And there's an opportunity for me to make a fan on both sides, on this side, right? So here's some, just joining them at the same position. 
Again, be careful with this. If they're too small, the triangles are too small, sometimes it can cause even more problems, right? And the same thing goes here. Look, I have all these extra vertices. You're just hanging there. They need an anchor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a line that goes from here to here that anchors this one. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a fan that goes down to this particular point. So here. And you're like, why is he making all these vertices? Why, why bother, right? I'm telling you guys, if you don't do this and you try and use this in your game, it won't work. Because you know what? The computer is only as smart as you make it, <laughs> believe it or not. I just There's no other way to say that better, right? I mean, if you think that the computer is going to, or the, the, the algorithm is going to figure out what you want by itself, uh, I think the answer there is no. Sorry, I just want to make sure that I get the right. I don't have too much problem when I do this because if I do it wrong, then I'm just showing you guys the wrong thing and that's not good. <laughs> All right, cool. So I've got a fan. And you can see that if I, when I pull back out, I have this area that I've well defined. It's legal. And I say that in that it's legal in that there's either triangles or quads. All right, that's important when you model. Right. And I've I've pretty much defined this pretty good if I want to extrude it. So I give it some geometry. I'm going to go into control tab and click the face select mode and then select these faces that I want to extrude. These are all the faces I want to extrude now. I'm going to look at it from the side just for a second so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm going to see it from perspective mode, too. So there's my there's the side of my door. Right. I've created that geometry. And guys, uh, what have you learned from what I'm doing here? Is there some other way this can be done a little bit easier? The answer is yes, there is. Don't do it. <laughs> Hire people. Yeah, that's the thing. So notice I'm going to go here. I'm just, gonna, I'm just going to extrude, right? And if I pull this out a little bit, just a bit, you can see that I've got the arch that I wanted. And it's perfectly sym symmetrical on both sides, right? <laughs> It's not that that crazy, but it, can you imagine doing this for every piece, for the windows, for the for the ledges, for everything? And that's what you know, blender artists do. They sit there, and then can I get rid of some of these verts? Eventually, I can. There's ways of continuously removing and reducing, reducing um, poly count, because I don't want a very high poly count model. I want a low poly model, right? So going on that, do I really need? Unless I'm passing through this door, guys, do I really need a door, or can I use a texture? and a bump map, some kind of normal map, right? So it looks like a door, but there's no door, right? That's the other way to do it. But I want to show you this because this is just one way of adding detail to a, um, you know, a primitive, to create an illusion that there, this is a tower. Okay, cool. So that's one. And you can see that I've got the top. Let me just go back into... Uh, you know, the, to see what it looks like. So let's go back into the tower. So we see that we've outlined the door. It's on both sides now because of my mirror modifier. And I've got this other area here, and I could do the same thing, but hell no, I don't have time for that right now. Let's, let's talk about this little lip up here. How am I going to do this little lip? Because it's a little lip and then this top part, right? So again, I'm just going to flip it to the top. I'm going to go into solid mode. I'm going to select the top faces only. Right. And what I want to do is I want to expand these faces by extruding them. So I'm going to press the extrude button E. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to extrude up so that the bottom of my, my edge is kind of the right size. There we go for the tower. Press enter. You can see now that my tower has expanded a little bit. I got that little lip that I wanted. Again, don't worry about being perfect because you're using it as a reference. It's only a reference. Okay, it doesn't have to be perfect, right? And what I want to do now is I want to expand the, the object here on the side, right? So I'm just going to kind of create this going around the object just to create the lip. Here it is. I'm going to use the E key and then immediately press return or enter. And what this does is it actually layers <laughs> verts on top of verts. So I've doubled the amount of vertices, one layer on top of each other. Now I can actually extrude out the way I want. And if I press, just to go back to my uh, 
what I can see here, I want to extrude this way and extrude the other way. So I'm going to, I'm going to say that, well, I'm, going to, I'm actually going to scale. I'm going to scale across the x-axis some amounts, not too much, right? And if you notice, from a scaling perspective, right, didn't scale out that much, just a little bit. And I'm going to do the same thing with the, uh, the y-axis. So scale across the y-axis just a little bit, not too much, just so it matches kind of that top part of the tower. All right, so there we go, the top part of the tower. All right, we've done this piece. Now there's a couple of options for the top, right? So again, if I go back to the front view, go in the wireframe mode, you can see that I've got uh, the top of the tower kind of fleshed out the way I want, right? Without the details, we haven't even need, added all those other details in there. That's a whole other pile of work, right? Maybe what I would do is for some of those crenellations and some of the way that it comes down, what I would probably do is I would probably take make one piece and then duplicate it a bunch of times and then add it to the model uh, that way as opposed to the way the way it looks right now. But this uh, this roof is going to give me a bit of an issue. One is it's not a straight roof, right? So you know what? It's not going to look perfect. Also, the roof overhangs, which also presents a problem, right? It's almost like there's a, a bit of a lip on this one too, right? So there's my lip, right? But it's quite a big lip compared to this one. So let's do that lip again. So I'm going to go back to the top. Okay, and I want to expand this thing. So I'm going to press uh, right, right shift, right click. And if I press the C key, actually, I can just, I can just select the top of the roof by using C select mode or circle select. And press escape to get out of that. And what I want to do is I want to do the same thing. I want to extrude. Press the E key and press enter. And this time. Time, what I want to do is if I want to press the S key to expand this way. That's kind of different. So it's just expanding this way. So I'm not expanding up. I'm just expanding to the side. Almost creating a base for my object like this. Now there's a bit of, see this little thing that's going on right here, this little shininess? That's called Z fighting, right? Yeah. Is that a question? No? It's called Z fighting. Z fighting means when there's two things on top of each other and they're flickering. You see that flickering happening? It's called Z fighting, right? We don't want any Z fighting in our model, but we're going to correct that by pulling those things up. All right, so what I want to do here is I want to ex expand up a little bit, just a, a touch. So I'm going, to, I'm going to scale across the Z axis just a little bit. Oops. Let's try that again. First, I'm going to extrude. And then I'm going to scale across the Z axis, right? I want to pull this, this stuff up, right? Actually, what I could just do is just do one of these and pull it up. There we go. Now there's no Z fighting anymore, right? So I've got a bit of a lip. That's the top of the tower. And if I look, and if I look at the front view, you can see that that's what I've done. Right? It's not quite accurate, but it's okay. And what I want to do now is I want to pluck the middle part of the tower, this middle part here, and I want to make a point. But I don't want to select all the other points all at the same time to make that point. So I'm going to use something called I'm going to use something called proportional editing. All right? So I'm going to go control tab, I'm going to go into vertex select mode, select this vertex right here, right? Only the middle vertex, right? And what I want to do here is I want to click on this little button for proportional editing. So I'm going to say enabled. And then when I drag this blue arrow, at the same time, I get this circle. The circle is my influence, my level of influence for proportional editing. The larger I make the circle, the more it influences the other, other objects, right? If I make it smaller, there's less influence. If I make it bigger, there's more influence to give me that tower look right to it. So that's what I want to do. But I want to do it so I can see what I'm doing, right? So I'm going to do it again. And I want to just, I don't want to bring it too much big, too big. I want to kind of reduce, if I make it too big, what happens is you get this kind of uh, thing where you can make the tower be more flexible, almost like bend the tower, a bendy tower, right? So I don't want to make the circle too big. I'm, all I'm doing to make that circle is I'm scrolling in and out while I'm pulling in proportional editing mode, right? So I'm kind of making it small, keeping it small. 
And I'm going to pull the tower so it's approximately the size of the other one, the top of the tower. Remember, we're slightly off center from the tower and it's slightly bent, so it's not going to look exactly perfect. Yes, yeah, pretty good. But we've got some issues, right? Let's fix the issues. So notice that, again, using the tower, and I'm using mirror modifier, I can bring this, well, let's undo that. Let's take, uh, let's take our proportional editing off. I can bring this down, right? Just like it shows here, almost like a slope. It looks like the slope, right? So a little bit more to create this thing. I need some more geometry here. I can actually add more geometry if I want. I'm not going to do that here. But you can see that I want to take this point here and bring it as, as much as possible over here. So I'm going to kind of drag this point to the edge, almost like a mast. And the same thing goes on that side. You can see, again, there will be opportunities for us to, um, to mirror on all angles if I, if I really wanted to. Again, so again, I've got this shape that I'm kind of, I've created. I do need some more geometry, guys. I really do. I need some here and here. It'll give me more... I got, I'll give me more sh a shape that I want. I can add more geometry later. I'm going to stop here from a time perspective because I got some stuff to show you in Unity. But I want to take a look at what I've got. All right, so if I look at my, my, my model, that's my tower. And that's the first part of my tower, right? I want to apply the mirror modifier now, all right? So I'm going to go back into object mode. It kind of looks like this, right? It's not perfect. There's more work to be done. I know this. I know I could spend another half an hour or whatever. You, you guys, you, we've spent about an hour on this already, all right, roughly. Guys, an hour, and we've hardly done anything. We've already put a notch into this thing, right? For me to get really detailed, I need to get the brick. I need to start uh, layering, texturing. I need to change more, you know, of my, um, my object. I may have to manually paint in, in different places. We haven't touched that yet, right? So you can see I want you to get an appreciation for the, the work that's being done. Right when it comes to the models we see in things like uh, Skyrim, all those all those three D models that you see in different uh, first person shooter games, somebody out there is you know is producing these models. A lot of times, it's, unfortunately, in Canada, it's offshoring. You do a lot of offshoring do that stuff because it's cheaper. Um, but that's what happens, and they create these models and they use in our game as assets. Right? Someone might say, "Well, wait, what if I download it from the asset store? Is that okay?" Yeah, of course it's okay. Right? But the idea is for you to understand how to use it, for understand, sure, for our, for our little project, it's okay, right? But in the future, if you're going to make your own game, right, if this is your job, if this is your work, if this is what you want to do as, as game, um, game students, you need to know a little bit about this. At least hire somebody who knows what they're doing, right? Like, like it was mentioned earlier, right? Anyway, so, so we got this, but there's also one more modifier I want to show you. First of all, I want to apply this modifier. So I, I can only apply it in object mode. I can't apply it in, in, in edit mode. If I click apply, and if I go back into edit mode, you can see now that I've got geometry everywhere. I have full control now again, right? And if I wanted to, I could just chop this model up again and, and, uh, and you know, continuously, uh, you know, do another iteration. I want to add a window up here, and I don't want to follow the reference 100%, right? And I don't want to work so hard. There's another modifier we can use. I'm just going to bring this back into object mode. And notice that my, my um, cursor is down at the bottom. I'm going to do shift A, and I'm going to add another cube. Let's add another cube. I'm going to bring this cube all the way up to the, to the model itself, right? So this is just kind of up here where I want the cube. It's inside the model right now. And I'm going to scale it across the Y axis, okay? Only across the Y axis. So it's going to actually physically stick out of my model. There's a method to this. There's a reason why I'm making this. So please bear with me. All right. So now what you see is it's perfectly symmetrical on both sides. Because I haven't moved my model around. Right. And I've got a pretty good size for my window. I want to make my window about that size. Let's say kind of a big window. Let's say let's scale it across the X axis. Well, let's make it so that the window is kind of looks like that. That's my window. All right. Now you're gonna say, what the heck? You got this big cube that's intersecting, bisecting inside of my my tower. Yep, I do. And I'm gonna make another model, another another modifier. I'm gonna go into add modifier. I'm gonna to go to Boolean. And what Boolean will do is it allow me to chop out part of my model using another object, right? So first of all, let's rename my tower, tower. 
So here's my tower. And I have this other object I just made called cube. A lot of times you can also call it our Boolean. So we're, I'm going to call it Boolean. A lot of times I want to do this. So I can identify the Boolean object really quickly, right? So here's my tower. Here's my Boolean, right? Let's kill this modifier. So here's my tower. I want to add a Boolean modifier to the tower, like I said. And then I want to specify which object, which is my Boolean. And now it looks like this. This is wrong, right? But what this is saying, anywhere where the two objects intersect, I want to make a new object, right? I can also choose union, so it accepts both, or difference, which is what I really want. Now that I've done that, I can take this object, right? And I should be able to remove it, right? When, it, when it's done, when I, when, I, when I fix the modifier, when I do this, and if I apply the modifier, and if I take this object away, you can see now that there is a hole in my tower, dear Liza, right? So I've, what I've done is I've used a Boolean modifier to chop out stuff. And sometimes that's a lot easier than physically going in and modeling everything by hand. Just chop it into, into the shape you want. And then from there, go and modify everything and mirror and all that stuff, right? Because it's just faster. However, it does cause some artifacts. And I'm just going to hide the Boolean for a second, right? And go back into my tower. Here's my tower. And if I go back into edit mode, you can see that... I've got some additional geometry that I got to take care of. I got to join this stuff. Like you notice on the back, there's some, I got to maybe, maybe create some edges here. You know, I've got some areas that are not going to really work. Like on the top here, I've got these things that need to be done. And if I don't do it, I'm going to have the same problem that I talked to you about already, right? Because I have geometry inside the model as well as outside, right? Easiest way to get that done, right? is I can hide parts of the model, right? So I, let's say, for example, I want to control tab and I select my faces. I can choose the faces I want to hide on the model. Here's the faces I want to hide. I don't care about these faces right now. And I can just press H for hide. And I can do the same thing where I don't need any face, where, where I, so I can get in there and do some work, right? So I can kind of run in there, right? And maybe hide these things too as well, so hide. Right? So I have all the stuff that I need to make my model work properly. Right, So I can see what I'm doing. Right, I can control tab and go to vertex select mode. Right, And you can start seeing where I can add in you know, cuts across the vert vertices here. So I can handle some of the stuff that I've been doing. So again, um, you don't want to do it in, in uh, wireframe mode because you'll actually cut everything even behind. So you want to kind of drag your cut from here to here as much as possible. And what this will do is take care of some of those other issues we talked about earlier, which is we need quads. We can't have hanging verts just sitting there. You know, your program will not know what to do with them. It'll try and create something, and you don't know what it's going to create at the end of the day. Don't trust anything. It's like tr trusting a random, uh, I'm having some trouble here. It's, it's like trusting a random algorithm that you'd never wrote, right? I don't know. As a developer, I've always had a problem with that. I know I'm supposed to trust stuff. I know I am. It's just hard for me to. So again, I'll do the same thing here. Let's grab this vert. And all I'm doing is handling the inside of my model. But here's something to think about, right? All this work, take care. All this work to do a model, I'm gonna press uh, option H to bring all that stuff back. So this is all the, option H uh, basically unhides everything, right? And you can see now that I fixed my insides here, which is pretty cool. And I've got a window that's functional. So it looks like there's some kind of window or some kind of opening here. Maybe I'll put a bell in there, like a bell tower. I mean, there's lots of stuff to do here. If you're going to play some kind of military game, maybe there'll be some kind of gun in there. 
you know, whatever, something that you can do it, uh, maybe even a figure of a half, half a person's, uh, you know, body or something. There's lots of stuff you can do to make it more interesting. A light, a lamp, particle effects, smoke, you know, like lots of stuff you can do there. I'm going to save this model, right? This time is, I'm going to finally save it. I'm going to put it up on, um, on Slack. We're going to call this the tower, right? And we're going to put it on the desktop. Here's our tower. And, you know, again, think about all the work you need to do to continue making this uh, closer to what you need. Okay, so any questions around some hard surface modeling techniques we use? Very, very simple techniques, guys, um, that we kind of made. We used Control R for loop, cut, and slide, which allows us to, to make our controlled cuts as opposed to the subdivide tool that we used the last few weeks, right, which is just subdivide everything equally, right, uh, where Control R actually controls where we want to cut. We also use the K tool, the knife tool, to cut the shape that we wanted, and then the extrude tool to extrude the shape out. We also talked about maybe that's not the best thing to do if you're not going to make a door that's usable, right, as an example. Um, we've also used the Boolean tool, so the Boolean modifier, two modifiers, the mirror modifier to mirror everything for symmetrical modeling, and the Boolean modifier that allows to chop stuff in and out of a model. There's some great professional tools as well that you can download and pay for, like 10 or 15 bucks. There's some really cool add-ons you can get for Blender, but I'll probably talk about those the next time. There's actually a really cool box cutting tool that allows us to, box cutter allows you to re really do some really professional looking or great looking things like stencils, um, allows you to do things like engine work, more technical kind of work that allows you to do. There's also something called Pro Tools that allow us to do some extra stuff, some really good tools out there that you can use and they don't cost very much money. All right, so that's it for me for Blender Hour this week. I'm just going to close Blender for now, and I'm going to take this Tower Blender model and put it up on Slack for us so we can share it. Again, I don't expect you to use this at all in your game. I just want as just to compare what I have uh, with you, so that way you can go through and have an opportunity to uh, to try this out for yourself. Right? So there it is. Maybe you can come up with something better. All right, so... That's this. Now let's bring up Unity really quickly. I want to talk about the second part. I would normally record another one, but there's only 20 minutes left. Doesn't matter. It doesn't make any sense to make a 20 minute recording. Um, by the time I kick it off, it'll be I'll say I'll spend more time kicking it off than actually doing it. So let's bring up Unity. Please do this with me now. So Blender's done for today. I'm going to create a new project. I've already did it last uh, for the last class, but I'll do it again with you guys. A new project in Unity. Uh, it's going to be called Game 2015 W2018 Lesson 4C because you guys are the final uh, attempt at this. I'm also going to put this one up on GitHub, I think. We'll see how it goes. So on Slack, if you notice, I put up the SDK for the uh, Google Cardboard and the Google Daydream, Google Daydream, uh, you know, kind of the SDK, the package. So if you look up on, uh, again, on Slack, there's two. The actual package itself, the Google VR for Unity package is roughly, well, it's exactly 37 megs. Please download it from there right now, right? I want to show you this. Yeah, yeah, okay. Huh. I wonder why I did that. It's okay, I'll, I'll just create my own windows anyway. I don't know why. That, that was kind of a failure. So, yeah, I'll put my project. What I normally do is I put my project down here to give myself more uh, real estate here. I like to do that. And I take my game and put it up there. Um, that's good for now. And I'll call this the, I'll make a new uh, layout. I don't know what happened there. So I'll save my layout. And I'll call it uh, Tom's, Tom's VR layout, which I'll modify later. 
All right, so um, there we go. So we've got uh, a Unity project. And what I want to do here is I want to pull in the package, right? I have it already saved. So I've, I've got it under our George Brown College, under our um, VR project. It's this thing right here. It's a big package right here, 37 meg. The way to add that in is go to Assets, Import Package, and use Custom Package. I'm going to point to it and click open. And what this is going to do is going to take Google's VR package. I'm going to install, import everything. And it's going to install it inside of Unity. Now, the Google VR package comes with a bunch of stuff. It comes with the reticle. It comes with head control. It comes with a bunch of stuff that uh, you'd have to code yourself and tons of scripts to make uh, the Google VR stuff work. Um, like I talked about before with some of you, I've actually created an app on my iPhone. Uh, from this project, I'm using a Mac. For you guys, for the most part, I'll tell you from experience that the, that the Mac port of this thing doesn't work as good as the Android. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, I don't know if you guys have tried that out or whatever. It works, but the problem with it is it doesn't give you the control. The clicker doesn't work with uh, Google Cardboard or even Google Daydream. It doesn't work, right? There is no, I haven't seen anything that works yet. How about that? Right? I'm going to try it out. There's a couple of, of uh, headsets I still want to try. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to get a pretty cheesy uh, view of things. Right. So it gives you this Google VR um, folder. If I, if I kind of double click in there and go to demos, and if I go to scenes, and if I go to hello VR, I get this scene. All right. So here's the scene I want you guys to go to. I, I got that through the demos. Hello, VR. Both. It'll work with both. Now, unfortunately, uh, iOS and Xcode and Mad Mac won't support Daydream. But if you do it on the PC side, it'll say Daydream as an option. Okay? I'll tell you in a second. Right. So right now, what, what, it, what you have to do is in here, when you have your Unity project up, right? So I'm going to bring this a little, little tighter here. If I was to run this thing right now, it would give me an error, right? If I were to just run it, it's going to say, hey, man, you know, it's not supported. I can still run it by pressing the Option or Alt key. I can give you an example of what it would look like kind of in VR. This is kind of, you can press the Option key for this, right? And it tells you this because if I go to the uh, GVR controller main, you can see that it gives you some hotkeys on how to use this without a VR device by pra to practice with it. GVR controller main has taken over. It's all the scripts and all this stuff. Remember I showed you that first video earlier, the lynda.com? It's all changed since then. So ever since, ever since uh, Unity 5 and when we moved to Unity 2017, the entire interface, the entire API has changed, right? Which is difficult for a learning perspective, right? Because the book, even the book, the stuff that you're learning with our book that doesn't really kind of connect one to one with this. So, um, but the good thing is all the functions are still intact. The functions haven't gone away, it's just that they've been compartmentalized and made into um, additional components that you can add that you've added into the scene. So the first thing you need to do here is, and we're going to detail this more the next time we get together. I'm just giving you a, uh, I want you guys to take a look at it. Here's some homework for you beyond your regular, um, alpha, you know, kind of release that you're going to come up with next, right? Or first playable, I mean. Your first playable is going to be due in two weeks, like we talked about, right? Next class, we see you, right? So what I want you to do is take a look at some of these things that you get from the, the Google VR Cardboard uh, API, the SDK, and what they can do for you. I want to go into File. I want to go into Build and Run. And I want to create a new build for Android. I'm not, I've already done it for, for iOS, and unfortunately, she no worky nice uh, with, what I, what I, with what I got. I mean, it works. I'll show it to you guys later. I'll come around and you can see what the app looks like. Um, but at the end of the day, I want to make a new folder. I want to put my builds in a new folder called Builds. That's the first thing. Um, and then I want to make it kind of a – my target is going to be Android. right? We'll call it Android VR. And then click Save. Without any changes, this will fail. And uh, I'm showing you this, that what, what it'll try and do 
um, when you do your build and run is it'll try and find a compatible device. First of all, this is running on, it's not, it's not an Android, it's on my standalone, right? So let's try this again. So file, build settings. If I choose Android, right? I know, I got I to gotta fix that again. Let's go back into my, uh, uh, my settings. So go to draw, desktop, I did it wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's go back into what I just did and get rid of that builds folder. Try that again. All right, try that again. So what I wanted to do was more of going to um, build settings. And under build settings, what I wanted to select Android. Under Android, on the right, on the right, I want to choose, it's hard for you to see this, but there's player settings down here on the bottom. A couple things you need to do to make this work. Uh, one of the things is your product name has to change, right? So it's too long, right? Game 2015, you know, uh, W 2018 Lesson 4C. Let's just call it uh, Android VR. My company name will make it George Brown, George Brown College, right? So I kind of change that. Scroll down, I'm going to turn on XR settings. So this is my video supported, my, my VR supported. And I'm going to choose, see how it says cardboard or daydream? Let's call it, just choose cardboard for now. Well, you have a choice of cardboard or daydream. If you try this with the iOS, only cardboard is available. Okay. Um, once I've done that, I want to go to, um, so other settings is where we actually create our package for Android. So notice it says com.company.product name. We, we, this is reverse DNS naming, just like normal Android stuff. So it's ca.georgebrowncollege.androidvr. That's how it should be. And that's kind of, the package name is a unique name that will be on the Play Store. When you put this up on the Play Store, your game, it's a unique identifier. So whatever the game, the name of the package is with your company name and then .ca, that is a unique identifier that's going to be used in the Play Store. I definitely do not want the minimum API to stay at Jelly Bean. It's got to be at least KitKat, my recommendation, okay, if not higher. It says automatic for the highest installed. Uh, definitely you want to choose what you have. Now, I, I have higher than Nougat. I have Oreo on this one, but uh, like I've shown you before, but anything that's higher, that's up there, 24 or 25 is okay. I'm going to leave it as automatic, okay? All the rest of this stuff uh, can stay the same, but I have a problem. And this is what, what you're going to see in a second. My problem is I don't have a phone to plug into this thing. It needs an actual device right, for it to test with. If I try Jenny Motion, it will fail. It's not a real device. It's a virtual device, right? So you need an actual device for this to work in because it's a VR game, right? So, again, you know, take it for what it is. Um, for you, at least one of the people in your team, if we're going to do Google via Google Cardboard or Google Daydream, should have an Android phone, at least one. Okay. On that, I've been talking with I'm going to talk with Alex about stuff. There's a couple of options. One is Google VR, Google Android, uh, Google Daydream. Google Daydream is a little better. I'll be honest with you. It's got a, it's got it's about a hundred dollar headset compared to the twenty five dollar headset you can find or forty five dollar headset uh, from a cardboard perspective. Um, we want to have the ability to have a clicker. Right to allow you to do something with it with some kind of handheld control. Um, there are some cheap headsets that I've been investigating, like for example, I think there's one called Merge VR. Merge VR, and if I wonder if I have an image for that, looks like this, right? Merge VR. It also comes with a. Um, it kind of does both uh, MR and VR, so. Augmented reality as well as because you, it actually allows your phone to be seen through the back like this, right? So merge VR. Um, and if I was to search it on the Canadian um, Amazon, so if I go to Amazon.com.ca and search for merge VR, right? Unfortunately, it's not thirty nine bucks, right? I don't think so. Um, Fifty eight, right? And if you go with the one that you really want. 
there are some other cool options. The reason why I'm, I'm recommending something like this, and I'm not sure if it's this or not, I'm, I'm going to see if this is possible, is because it has the ability for us to, uh, you know, to kind of put a smart board in there, plus a little bit of AR if we want to go there. It's also Prime. I, also try, I always try and shop with Prime because yeah, I know it'll come. It won't come from China, right? Uh, it'll come within a couple of days. There are some other options that I've also looked at. Like, for example, when you see something like this, where you have some kind of controller like this, it entices me to think about buying it because I'm like, hey, maybe, maybe with a, with a controller, I can actually have some kind of more control over the headset that I have. So there's lots and lots of them out there. Um, what was that? You can use any Bluetooth controller, like even if it, if it connects to your Android phone, yeah. right? It won't work with, with iOS. Don't even try it, right? some support but you're not going to see a lot and sometimes it's spotty uh sometimes it'll connect to bluetooth sometimes it won't right i i gotta be honest i mean i, I just don't think there's enough support out there for it what was that it's also way, more way more expensive right so again we're looking at like for cardboard you're going to talk about something like between 40 and 50 dollars right something in that range right um daydream if i was going to look at daydream so if i go google daydream huh? yeah it's about 100 um so here's daydream i wonder if see if they, they show you the headset um it kind of gives you a better headset it kind of looks like this it comes with a controller right which is what i'm looking at some kind of clicking control that allows us to control stuff in vr um, i think this is the better solution daydream is probably there if we have if, i mean if i can get like you know as an example 20 sets or even 10 sets like one for every team i think that's pretty cool i think it's enough right uh, it's good enough that you're going to get pretty good control. You can launch your app um, as an example here. Like, for example, if I go here and build now, let's build now, build and run. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I don't really have to. It'll do it automatically for you. It'll do if it's only one. It'll add the, it'll add the default scene in there for you, right? So if I go build and run. And if I uh, let me build that, uh, put the builds folder back in. So here's builds, and then let's let's try that Android VR stuff again. Android VR, and click save. It'll take my settings this time around, and but unfortunately, what it'll do is it'll look for a compatible phone. This is not right. That's not right. That's not right. I changed it before, right? So that's, that's that's why I'm that's why I'm concerned. I don't I don't know why I would do that. Yeah, I just can't see it. That sucks. Let's try and uh, let's try and go back into that uh, thing again before before I have a problem again and get rid of that stuff. Sorry, guys. Actually, Unity is really good for this. It's it's, it's pretty solid. Like you know, when it when it comes to cross platform performance, um, I don't have a lot of problems with it. You know, and it's pretty correctable. It's pretty quickly correctable. I'm not going to complain too much about it. I'm just going to take away my uh, my dock. I know we're running overtime, guys. I do apologize. I want to try this out for you guys. You can see the pain that's involved. Uh, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. Huh? 
Well, I'm just thinking, again, all I'm doing is making a build and uh, I'm talking at the same time being distracted. So it happens, right? And this is the error you're going to get. So I want to show you this error so you see it. You know, device means you just won't work. Remember that you, for, for you to use it, you're going to have to plug in your, um, plug in a, a device, make sure that it's on, on a USB port and make sure that's in developer mode, right? Is it on developer mode? I don't know if I have a. I don't know if I have a USB uh, USB cord. Do you have a USB cord? Do you have a USB cord? I'm trying, man. Hold on. I don't know if I have the right USB cord for you. That's the same problem. Do you? Okay. Um. Uh, we'll use my mouse cord. Yeah. Let's try this out. I just really hope it's going to work because, like I said, it's uh, not always okay. We're plugging in just for people who are watching this uh, this thing. We're plugging it in here. Can access storage device. Yes. Be allowed now. Good. And we'll just just to hide who you are and stuff. We'll just retry, and let's see how it goes. Now it says allow USB debugging. Press OK on the device. It's going to try it again. And now this, there's a real device connected to my machine. Allow it. And let's see how it works here. It should work on your machine in a second. Give it a sec. So it's good that you have one. And I'm, I'm going to try and get one uh, to use. It just doesn't, I don't have one right now. I have one at the other uh, college. It should be pretty cool, actually. It should be pretty cool, right? So let's see how it works. All right, so this is what I was afraid of. Create a build failed. See the console for details. What was that? And it happened before, by the way, as well. What version of uh, I mean, the API do you have on here? Seven, I think. It's oh, not sure. API should be 26. Is it 26? That's the reason. So let's go and back, go back to Guys, thank you so much for those people. Remember that tonight, or sorry, tomorrow, you've got your game pitch and your um, no, no, your game design document is due tomorrow, and then as well as your peer evaluation. There's two different labs for this. Please don't forget. And next week, when you come back, uh, we're going to be talking about um, your first playable release. Let's try making it. The minimum is even higher. Let's see. That might be the that might be the the thing that that's causing us our, our issues. Hmm. Oh, I'll choose ISO. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go one lower. Let's go to. It should be virtually compatible anyway, right? Yeah. Well, should should I think Marshmallow is in my system? Let's try that again. I'm just not using the right uh, version. And Gradle uh, Gradle uh, broke last time like this again. So we got to figure this out, but this doesn't seem to be working. It might also be my huh? Yeah. yeah. So one thing we could do is we could debug it by taking it into Android and from there. It might be something else we do. Okay, sorry. Didn't work. All right. So guys, thank you so much for for checking this out. This we're going to do more with this next time. Um, otherwise, we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, Tom.